welcome to this uh, Coimbra Group open session on the European Universities Alliances. My name is Ludovic Tilly. I'm the chair of the Coimbra Group Executive Board, and I will be moderating this webinar. I would like to welcome you all to this first Coimbra Group webinar. I would like to mention that we received more than 600 registrations for only 500 seats. So we are very happy to welcome you here for this first Coimbra Group webinar. I should maybe mention that the audience can make use of the chat room that is on the uh, dashboard. Uh, you can ask questions on this chat room and they will be uh, raised by myself during the question and answers to the speakers. I would like to add that the webinar is recorded and will be available on the Coimbra Group YouTube channel by the end of the week. I would like also to mention that this event was initially planned uh, to be held physically in Montpellier today, exactly at the same time, uh, during the Coimbra Group Annual Conference on the occasion of the 800th anniversary of Montpellier Universities. But as you know, unfortunately, the COVID-19 outbreak forced us to cancel the physical meetings and to replace them by a series of virtual events, including this one. So thank you again for joining us uh, to this event. This is the first Coimbra Group webinar on European Universities Initiative. As you may know, uh, since the very start in 2018, uh, Coimbra Group has been involved in the co-design process with the European Commission and has made the strong political choice to provide support to all Coimbra Group universities during the first and the second calls of the pilot phase. This support will of course continue during the next Erasmus Plus program and is already manifold. Coimbra Group is associated partner to alliances on knowledge sharing and dissemination. We have now a recurring section in the Coimbra Group newsletter to which you are all kindly invited to register. It's open to any, anybody. And we are going to organize series of open sessions on alliances. Today's event is the first one of a series where Coimbra Group groups aims at playing the role of a European platform to bring and exchange together the experiences and learning of Coimbra Group member universities involved in developing alliances. This webinar is open to um, everyone interested in the rolling out of the European Universities Initiative and the progress it is expected to make towards the achievements of the European higher education area. Today's program has been built to foster reflections and discussions, allowing to go deeper into the different alliances, processes of construction and their strategic approaches, while discussing the various difficulties that universities are facing throughout this process, reflecting on the innovating tools and approaches and providing inputs into the work of the European institutions and member states in this area. But just before that, I, should like, uh, I would like to add a few words on what is the Coimbra Group to those who do not know. Founded in 1985, the Coimbra Group is an association of 40 long established European comprehensive multidisciplinary universities of high international standard that are committed to creating special academic and cultural ties in order to promote internationalization academic collaboration, excellence in learning and research, and service to society. It is also the purpose of the group to participate to the co-design of European education and research policies. And you can find, of course, more information on the Curba Group on its website. And last but not least, all current developments have been impacted, of course, and will continue, unfortunately, to be impa impacted for some time by the COVID-19 crisis. Since the very first day of this crisis, the Coimbra Group has started to reflect on how we could transform this unprecedented situation into an opportunity for our network, as we have always done in the past, for sharing good practices in managing such an extraordinary crisis. This led to the first Coimbra Group briefing paper on higher education in late March, and this reflection was immediately extended through a comprehensive online questionnaire addressing 
all aspects of academic missions sent to Coimbra Group universities in early April. The responses for more than 33 Coimbra Group universities have been collected within a month, which was really quite a challenge, and have been analyzed and published <clears throat> less than two weeks ago on the 29th of May in a second Coimbra Group report on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education and research. And of course, this report is available on our website. And as you can easily imagine, today's speakers will surely include in their reflections some elements about the impact of this unprecedented crisis on the development of their alliance activities and strategies. After these first uh, welcoming words, it is now time to, to start our program. And I would like to welcome uh, our first introductory speaker, uh, who is Sofia Eriksson, uh, who will join us now. Uh, Sofia Eriksson is Director for Youth Education and Erasmus Plus Programme at the DGEAC, at the Commission. And Sofia, first of all, thank you very much for being with us. And your speech is on the latest developments of the European Universities Initiative. And as you can easily imagine, we are all eager to hear what are these uh, latest developments. Sofia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And dear Ludovic and the dear Coimbra Group members and all the participants, I think there are a number of participants at this webinar, several hundreds, if I understand. Uh, I'm, it's always very, very, uh, it's a pleasure for, for me to always uh, connect with Coimbra Group and its members. Uh, to discuss uh, the future together and especially now when we will focus uh, on the uh, next steps of the European Universities Initiative. I don't know if you are aware, just a, a fact or a figure in the beginning of my presentation. The uh, Erasmus Mobility to and from uh, Coimbra Group uh, <coughs> Universities, it actually accounts for 16% of all Erasmus students in Europe. So just to say that the Coimbra Group and, the, and its members, it's a very strong uh, advocate for internationalization in higher education. So congratulations to that. So let me start uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. This has exposed millions of learners, <coughs> sorry, teachers and researchers to new challenges new ways of learning, teaching, examination, communication, and doing research. I must say, we must all applaud the sector's incredible uh, resilience and the adaptability and solution-oriented approach to make sure that the, um, that the teaching and the learning could continue in the pandemic times. And uh, we could see there was a lot of joining forces also uh, both on the education and research and innovation sides to help tackle the crisis. Everything, of course, from the cutting edge uh, research on vaccines and treatments of the, of the COVID-19 virus, but also demonstrating a lot of societal engagement through dedicated actions of students and staff. Now, the crisis has, of course, uh, put to the visible light uh, a lot of strengths, and that's great, but also a lot of weaknesses of our education systems. And it's clear that the impact of COVID-19 on higher education has been enormous, and that we can speak of all institutions and all students have been affected. So, uh, of course, together with uh, trying to uh, find a way out of the crisis, we must continue this path uh, to, that we have already started before the pandemic set out uh, in terms of a strong and important transformation, uh, the so-called twin tra transformation of green and digital. And we, it's true that we can be for sure that how we handle now this crisis, it will have a long-lasting impact on the whole economy and the society, how, it will, how they will develop in the future. And in this context, I think we will all agree that deeper cooperation is absolutely key. Deeper cooperation between universities, it will be instrumental for a transformative recovery. So let me now turn to what we can offer at the European level. Uh, please uh, keep the previous slide. 
how can we, uh, how can we, what can we offer at European level to accelerate this transformation? And I would like to highlight two essential points here. First of all, keep up the direction and the ambition. And second point, investment. So first, while we address the new challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, we should not forget our other priorities, important priorities. First of all, we need to remain committed to empower our students uh, with solid scientific insights. And we need to combine this striving for excellence in learning outcomes with a very strong emphasis on social inclusion. And this is a clear ambition of the European pillar of social rights. Everyone has the right to quality and inclusive education and lifelong learning in order to enable them to participate, participate fully in society and manage successfully transitions in the labor market. And higher education has a key role to play in this uh, high ambition. At the same time, higher education will be indispensable in steering our continent in the direction of a greener, more sustainable future. And of course, better integrate the smart and responsible use of digital technology into our life. And I'm happy to share with you, and you are many of you are already aware, but we have four relevant, uh, under this context, four relevant commission initiatives that are planned in the pipeline for this year. First of all, uh, a communication setting out the, the path for the European education area. We have a communication plan on the European research area. We're looking forward also to a new digital education action plan, of course, very pertinent in this uh, digital learning, online distant learning context and a new skills agenda for Europe. And this leads me to the second point. We need investment. And there's no doubt that we are facing difficult times ahead. We all agree on that. But it is also important that we don't forget any part. So if we are saying it's important to invest in research, we also need to be clear that it's important to invest in education. This is key for our recovery and beyond. So uh, the proposed total budget of the future Erasmus program of almost 28 billion euros, it was announced recently by Commission, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, and it fully reflects this high ambition, this priority. Uh, the recovery plan and the new MFF proposal, it focuses on mitigating the devastating effects of the pandemic on European people and economies. And we should be aware that universities can benefit from a variety of EU instruments. So in addition to Erasmus and Horizon Europe, there will be new opportunities under the next generation EU, the EU's recovery instrument. For example, cohesion support will be strengthened and we know there will be more capacity for invest EU facility. So just to say that higher education institutions have a broad many of support opportunities. And I hope that they will use this, these opportunities to the fullest. Because we need this investment into higher education to equip people with competences to be resilient and lead the strong recovery. We need our young graduates to thrive in society and find jobs that match their expectations. But we also need that all adults should be able to upskill and reskill because unfortunately far too many people have lost their jobs during the pandemic. And we need strong institutions which can be drivers of all the top ambitions and priorities. So this clearly presents an opportunity. As you also said, Ludovic, the crisis can be turned into an opportunity. And it highlights a duty for universities to rise to the challenge. And this is where the European universities come in. Central to this concept is the idea that pooling resources and working together is essential absolutely necessary actually for quality and inclusion for excellence and innovation for recovery and resilience actually it's still the the previous slide sorry about that and we have already learned a lot about joining forces in this initiative 
perhaps even more during COVID-19. So let me also take this opportunity to thank all those Coimbra members that are part of these alliances. You have shown many good examples during the crisis, and I don't dare uh, mention any, any examples, but it made me think I saw another tweet this morning from Una Europa's excellent student hackathon. Uh, but there are many of these uh, examples that have really helped during this crisis period. And a recent survey um, that we did from uh, of the 114 higher education institutions uh, involved in the European Universities Initiative, it actually showed that more than 60% of these institutions consider that being part of a European university has been helpful in addressing the current crisis. This is especially true for those that are most advanced in the implementation. And almost all institutions answered that they would have been better prepared to face the pandemic if the European Universities Initiative was fully operational, fully implemented. And the survey also shows that 60% have started pulling together online courses or MOOCs uh, that are accessible to students from all their member universities. So this is impressive. This is less in less than a year, and it's very promising. Now, next slide, please. So what is the next steps for the selected European universities? We now expect that European universities will start or accelerate again or continue focusing their efforts on implementing their ambitious long-term vision involving all, uh, all their, their partners, their partner universities, their students, their academic and administrative staff, their associated partners, and so on, in a strong transformational process. And we expect that alliances will help us in identifying where there may be existing obstacles at both national and EU level, so we can also facilitate and smooth this uh, transnational operation of the European universities. And I want to inform you of some uh, um, upcoming steps uh, to continue our co-creative efforts of this initiative, as we have done since the start. We will uh, organize a joint webinar between all the European universities and the member state representatives. Actually, it's later this week. And the purpose of this meeting is to discuss the experience so far and if we can already identify some possible solutions to unleash the full potential of the alliances. You may, you may be aware that there is a second call for proposal uh, that, would, that was launched in, in November last year. And in one month's time, we will announce the results we expect uh, to have another 24 additional European universities, universities bringing the total number to 41. So to support specifically the Alliance's research and innovation dimension, and this is some, something we have discussed at several occasions, and it's been a request or a wish for many of the uh, universities and the Alliances. So there, <coughs> a specific uh, top-up call was launched uh, recently under Horizon 2020 to specifically target the research and innovation dimension of European universities. So I hope the alliances will use this new funding opportunity. And generally, we encourage universities to use all available EU instruments to implement uh, this transformative long-term strategy. We also encourage the co-financing by member states Today, we have as many as 12 member states uh, that have uh, concretely uh, gone, gone forward in this co-financing. And we hope that this will be an inspiration for others and that other member states will join in this effort. Now, these 41 European universities that we will have uh, will be announced, uh, the, the, the remaining of them in July. But this total amount, let's say, of alliances will of course be monitored, we will follow them and exchange between each other, uh, but at the end uh, it will also be evaluated by independent experts. And those that are on the right track will be able to uh, reapply for further funding under the next Erasmus program. And I should also say under the next um, multi-annual financial framework 
we will further develop the synergies between the education and research and innovation dimensions. And by doing so, it's good to see that we will help building a true European education area, which is closely connected with the European research area. And this will enhance the free circulation, not only for students, but also for researchers and for scientific knowledge. Next slide, please. So, building on the testbed of the Erasmus Plus European universities, we are going to continue co-developing a shared vision on the universities of the future. And this we want to do together with you, the wide higher education and research community, with students and member states. And we will be follow following up on this with broad consultations and dedicated co-creation co meetings. And the ambition is that all higher education institutions in Europe can be part of the transformation, but at their own pace. Because we see we need a broad modernization aimed at the entire higher education community, with its more than 5,000 institutions, to work step by step and together towards this common endeavor. Next slide, please. So what we will be focusing on. First of all, promoting inclusion. Next slide, please. So first of all, promoting inclusion so that no one is left behind. It's absolutely essential that a wider range of students from very different profile can access higher education. And for its recovery and future development, Europe needs to invest in people and all its people. And secondly, linked to that is lifelong learning, because knowledge is in constant development and we need to keep on learning. But we also see that full degree programs may not always be the best suited for such continuing learning activities. And this is why we are working on promoting short learning courses leading to micro-credentials. And I'm happy to, uh, to share with you that just two weeks ago, we had the first meeting of our expert group with the participation of Commissioner Gabriel, our first virtual meeting, I should say. Third, uh, we need to remove red tape for the delivery of joint degrees where students attend several universities. This will hopefully lead to a European degree automatically recognized uh, within the EU. And we know that this would be beneficial for uh, especially the European universities, but probably also beyond. And fourth, we need a modernized European quality assurance system. COVID-19 has highlighted the need for more transnational cooperation in quality assurance. And uh, just think of how education went online in an unprecedented scale and very much beyond borders. So this is a necessity. And for this, we would like to review the existing Council and European Parliament recommendation of 2006. It needs to be updated, a bit modernized, and we would like this recommendation to call for establishing of a European recognition and quality assurance system. And finally, we would like to explore the feasibility of a European statute for European universities and other university alliances to be able to flourish and overcome obstacles stemming from, we know, disparities sometimes between uh, national laws and practices of different member states. So these policy developments, we hope that they will help to accelerate the transformation towards the universities of the future, not only for the European universities, but for all higher education institutions in Europe. So thank you again for inviting us to be here. And we all agree these are challenging times, but I'm really glad to see that they have not prevented you from continuing to support the European Universities Initiative and continuing uh, our work together. And we know cooperation is absolutely key to accelerate the transformation of higher education into the force we need to shape the future. And just to say education, Research and innovation are a European common good, which needs to serve and reach out to society. And you are a key player 
at the intersection of these fields. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sofia, for this uh, really comprehensive presentation of uh, what's hot on the table and there are many many things as we as we could expect of course um just to mention that uh, while you you were uh, talking we were joined by now more than 360 people so uh, so this is uh, really really interesting and i would like to uh, remind to the audience that they can actually uh, ask questions through the chat room and some of these questions will be raised during the question and answers and actually we are about now to uh, start uh, discussing a little bit uh, uh, with you sofia uh, while the questions are arriving i have already a few a few ones of course, maybe the most urgent one is uh, related to the uh, impact of the COVID-19, as you mm -hmm. rightly uh, uh, exposed at the very beginning. Indeed, this has been uh, immediately uh, taken uh, very seriously by the European Commission, and we were actually uh, really glad to see this uh, solidarity uh, taking off uh, rapidly. Um, and I would like actually specifically ask a question about the so-called recovery uh, package. Um, and because you mentioned indeed that this uh, uh, recovery package will, will be uh, in a way at the disposal of universities, not only of course, but in this, the present context to universities to uh, support them uh, trying to remedy to the, the, the post-coronavirus uh, damages. Um, and we know, for instance, that the, 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 the next framework program for research, FP9 Horizon Europe, will have actually a top up uh, coming from this recovery package uh, of about 14 billion. Is there actually a, a similar approach to the Erasmus program, or it will only be through a diversity of instruments that ed education re will be supported through this uh, recovery package? You can of course, imagine that we, we would like to see that education is also directly supported uh, through the recovery package. Yes. So that's my first question. Thank you very much for, for a very, very important, pertinent and, and uh, current uh, question. Um, no, I think the, the whole, uh, the, the recovery plan, you can see it, in, it has two legs. You have the recovery, the next uh, generation EU, uh, with the different instruments and then you have a revised uh, MFF proposal and in this uh, uh, as the as you mentioned the horizon uh, top up this is not exactly uh, the case for Erasmus but it is it it doesn't mean that there are not other many actually other opportunities more for higher education and for uh, linked to let's say Erasmus and I would mention uh, some of them. I mean, we should really look into the details of all the different proposals, because I should say the next generation EU is, is a very ambitious recovery plan. You know, it's, it's a mix of, uh, of grants and loans. And mm -hmm. under this uh, next generation EU instrument, you will find a number of reinforced uh, instruments, both on the grants and the loan side. I could mention, uh, I would like to mention perhaps uh, what comes to my mind here is the strength and the cohesion uh, support, where you will see that there's a lot of uh, potential for supporting infrastructure. And there I mean also infrastructure, not building only, but I'm talking about digital infrastructure to really improve uh, the resilience of, uh, of our education systems. So this is a very important first point. I would also like to mention uh, InvestEU, where in itself it, uh, it will be many more possibilities for, for loans and that can, uh, can in a way also be infrastructure and so on. But you may also be aware of a recent launch of the so-called uh, education and skills window of InvestEU. This has a lot of potential and we, we hope that this uh, will trigger new ideas. It, it is in a way a continuation of, uh, of the previous Invest EU and the student loan. And you can imagine that by adding many more opportunities, so broaden the menu of what can be uh, supported under Invest EU. Then we have other uh, like facilities of React EU and so on. So it is in a way a full list of what may be possible for education. This is uh, clearly uh, part of this first leg of, of recovery 
instrument. But then we should also look at the broader menu of uh, under the revised MFF, in addition to, let's say, what the, a strong, uh, a continued strong Erasmus and Horizon Europe can offer. We know that uh, we should also look at in, uh, in other programs like uh, Digital Europe. There, I think this program is extremely relevant in these times, and we know that there are a lot of possibilities there for uh, improved connection. So in addition to the infrastructure, I think if one looks at the potential opportunities for universities, uh, the menu is fantastic. It is really an important uh, menu and a broader menu. So you can actually find the uh, support, everything from infrastructure, connectivity, uh, learning content, and of course the pedagogy and support as we know it also mm -hmm. in the Erasmus and Horizon program. So we, we hope actually that this menu will not be too complicated so we can find our ways in the menu uh, because yes. you know of course <laughs> the idea is not to make this uh, uh, more complex than it is already so let's mm -hmm. hope that indeed this will be clear to to all uh, stakeholders so that we can indeed just go to the point which is to remedy to the current uh, crisis of course yeah i should mention that uh, mm -hmm. we have a lot of questions coming of course and and we don't have so much time so mm -hmm. uh, let me just briefly uh, launch a few of them uh, there are very practical questions regarding mm. uh, the results of the second uh, call. Uh, you mentioned that this should be early uh, July. I, ju mm. I just continue very quickly and then you can uh, uh, please uh, uh, respond short in short. Um, also some, some uh, audience asking uh, about if there will be already a new call uh, under the next uh, Horizon, uh, sorry, the next uh, Erasmus program, mm. or will we see actually already a call at the end of this year, 2020? Uh, so clearly, uh, people asking for clarifications here. Um, also, synergy between the different programs uh, with respect to the alliances. This has started with specific call in the Horizon uh, uh, mm -hmm. 2020. Will this continue? Will this be developed? And there are so many other questions. Unfortunately, uh, we will probably come back to this uh, on different occasions, uh, hopefully. Yes, no, and I'm happy to uh, continue conversations, of course, after this uh, session and, and reply to other questions and engage uh, in discussions with pleasure. Uh, for the next, uh, let's say, the next call, um, Let's say we, we have, uh, when we discussed with, uh, actually in the co-creative effort we did uh, to uh, look at the next steps under the future MFF for uh, European universities, uh, it was uh, a clear uh, feedback from both uh, member states, from the alliances themselves and from the more broader uh, stakeholder community that there was not a particular wish now to uh, launch immediately a third call. It was rather the feedback that let's now focus on these uh, two pilot calls. We will have more than 40 alliances. Let's draw the important lessons. Uh, uh, or let's look at the, let's assess how far they have come and we can draw some lessons. And only after we feel comfortable what these lessons are, we should launch a new call. So that was the feedback we have received, which would mean that you would not have a call until uh, to be published uh, autumn 2021. Just to say that it, it is just I'm referring to feedback from uh, discussion. So we are, of course, still open to, to uh, consider this. But uh, this was a quite strong view. As we are in a pilot phase, we should also uh, focus our efforts in, 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 uh, in drawing lessons from this pilot. For synergies, clearly, this is what we wanted to uh, encourage already now with the Horizon 2020 top up. And we hope we, we will uh, encourage many of the alliances to, to take part in this. It will be the same opportunity for the first 17 and the, four, and the, uh, and the remaining uh, 24. This is uh, something we are uh, also hoping to continue uh, in the future MFF. And we know that we have worked very closely together colleagues between DJ EAC and DJ RTD to make sure that our, the modalities are, are, are correct in our legal basis and we hope the, uh, the co-legislators are also fine with this. So all the opportunities of synergies and complementarities are definitely there. So now we want to test with this top up and, um, and build on that uh, to intensify synergies uh, as from the next MFF. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sofia, for this uh, responses. They're clear uh, as usual. Uh, of course, we we would need 
probably a few hours to continue and exhaust uh, if we can exhaust the topic. So, but we have to 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 move on for the for the program. So, thank you very much for being with us, Sofia. And thank you. we, of course, look forward to our continued discussion on this topic and many others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.